Hello everyone, good morning, good day, good evening, good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Wolfgang Maurer. I'm greeting you live from uh, Regensburg, Germany, which is close to Munich and where it's now more good evening than good day. Um, I welcome you to my talk on safety, security and quality artificial intelligence versus common sense. Um, right in the beginning, let me promise that um, since I've experienced that it takes quite a bit of concentration uh, to listen to non-live webcasts, I guess we'd all rather be spending our time right now in a conference room somewhere in North America and talk to each other in person, which is much more relaxed. So I will try to keep my talk quite short and um, instead focus on the Q&A session in the end, uh, which is also an interesting thing for me to do because um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to talk about some of um, some research results that people in academia and science have come up with during, say, the last 10, 15 years to apply methods of artificial intelligence or machine learning. I don't really uh, make any philosophical distinction between these two um, these two um, names. Um, introduce um, these to you, discuss discuss a little bit what I think could reasonably be applied in open source systems, but I'm also eager to learn from you as industrial practitioners um, where the areas of applicability for such methods and where problems that could probably benefit from uh, such methods are. I have a, for those who don't know me, a dual role. For one, I work with Siemens Corporate Technology. And that's maybe a, a good time to switch from the title slides to my actual slide desk. So you should be seeing, let me put that to that screen. Just a second, I'm solving a window shifting problem. Okay, so you should hopefully be seeing my uh, my slides now, my slide deck in full screen mode. If not, please ping me on the uh, chat channel. But it seems to work. So I was mentioning for those who don't know me, I have a dual role. I work at Siemens Corporate Research in the Embed Linux department, uh, where I do practical applied work. And I also have a research group at the Technical University of Applied Regensburg, where I think about the more fundamental issues of software engineering. Yeah, I've said that. So um, why do we want to use uh, what are the what are the main um, um, what are the main um, possibilities to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning in software engineering? If you look at the literature, it turns out it's free classes of problems where um, machine learning techniques can support our work as software engineers, but also our work as integrator. Um, the first, first category is classification, learning and predicting. That's naturally quite a good match. And that's the category uh, that has been investigated longest in in the area of software engineering. So uh, people have been using case-based reasoning, rule induction, and things like that for um, software project prediction for various properties you'd like to predict of software, be that quality, be that the time it takes uh, to finish a project to make uh, the notoriously hard predictions when things like um, software, or in our German case, perhaps airports, will be ready. We all know this is very easy to get wrong. And um, the hope is, of course, that software can and machine learning can help us to get that less wrong. People have also tried things like um, defect prediction and many more things um, in this in this regard. The uh, second big topic uh, in machine learning and software engineering is probabilistic reasoning with basically similar similar tasks, as I mentioned, before similar problems, as I mentioned before, but on a um, yeah more theory based in a more theory based setting where we just don't just benefit from uh, statistical insights, but do logical reasoning, proper logical reasoning, augmented uh, with some probabilistic components, augmented with um, 
dealing with uncertainty that uh, can, for instance, also help to model how users interact with software, which can help us in generating realistic test cases, can help us in generating, for instance, workloads that uh, stress schedulers um, and so on properly and uh, simulate, simulate general real world user behavior. And thirdly, we have uh, what is a what is the newest of the three research strands in um, this area, computational search and optimization. That is um, a technique to reformulate many software engineering problems that arise in programming as kind of optimization problems that can then be dealt with by um, going through large search, spa search spaces and finding um, optimal solutions that very often comes or uh, many papers about that deal with require things re like requirements, uh, software design, maintenance and testing. I think that's the least uh, good match to open source software because the problems studied are very, uh, very specific on occasion, but the first two have quite some good potential to be used in open source software. Um, research in these three areas very often is based on Linux as a data source, or if you want to call it that way as a guinea pig, because of course it's one of the largest known um, engineering undertakings that mankind so far is producing. We have lots of open co code, we have lots of open development data that researchers can use and feed in their machine learning models. And um, many projects of the Linux ecosystem, first and foremost, the Linux kernel are considered as role models of good for whatever value of good software engineering. So people naturally try to follow the success in that direction. Why, um, why am I interested in this, uh, in, uh, in applying machine learning to these open source development type problems? That's for two reasons. Firstly, I'm for various reasons interested in safety critical systems. Um, so I've seen some of the experts in the area in the talk, so I don't need to tell you much, or I, I probably cannot tell you much about the details of safety if you're an expert in that area, but, um, for everyone, everyone else, uh, including me, knows there's some some very hard to read, very complicated standards that describe how safety critical software is supposed to be built. There's only some experts in the world who can actually read these, understand these, and act accordingly. But um, on the other hand, we have the problem that we do not just want to use such software that is built with such highly expert knowledge, but that we want to use software like the Linux kernel, software that comes from the Linux ecosystem and then use it in safety critical uh, context. That sounds much like a contradiction, but if you ask the people who understand the standards, then they will tell you there's actually three ways of um, achieving certifications for safety critical software, three routes to safety. First one is standards compliant development. So obviously how it was intended in the beginning. Then you have um, compliant, non-compliant development and whatever that means. And then you have proven in use argumentations. And that is um, one thing or one, one, um, one aspect of safety critical systems where we place much hope in uh, machine learning because we are actively trying to engage machine learning techniques in understanding the processes that drive, that are used to develop um, projects in the Linux ecosystem that drive development of these projects and then learn the, pro the processes in a way that we can guarantee, um, guarantee the properties, the, re the reliability properties, the quality properties and so on that are mandated by, mandated by the uh, safety critical standards. The second reason, uh, or the second second project where we are partly trying to use methods from machine learning is the civil infrastructure platform. So here we're trying to support Linux systems for more than um, 10 years, more than a decade. Hopefully it's going to be two decades in the end, in the end that we can support a given system configuration over time. I'm not going to get into detail why this is important. Uh, why this is important for industrial applications, but I guess you can um, 
Well, I guess you can easily imagine that um, industry, when they build things like power plants, when they build things like airplanes, when they build things like uh, trains, they don't want to update the software every three weeks, like perhaps you are used to on your mobile phone. But um, in nuclear power plants, I think everyone agrees, even if we're going to shut them down eventually somewhere, uh, it's, it's wise to not update your software where every year it's also not wise to update your software every five years. So we need to keep it running in a safe way as long as that's possible. And that uh, also uh, um, implies um, us to get, obtain knowledge about um, many aspects that can benefit from machine learning. First thing is the software that we employ in these systems. Once we make a decision um, to focus or to, um, to, uh, to bet on a given component, then we are stuck with that for the next decade or so. And so we, we want to quantify our choice. We want to quantify our trust as well as possible. And that, of course, we can do by getting a, um, getting quantitative knowledge about the development process by, um, using machine learning to extract all the data that we can from public sources and then objectively, um, um, objectively say, um, um, objectively uh, um, make quality statements about these data. Uh, automated software engineering also comes into play here. So when we do backporting of patches, of security patches, of uh, functional patches, from one kernel release to another, which is a day-to-day -day business in the kernel community, say over two or three years, uh, timeframes, but if you go over 10 years of time and if you have to support five or six kernels in parallel, it gets a hard problem to even choose which patches to backport. You can do that if you have an unlimited supply of engineers, like perhaps Google or the Linux Foundation have for the newest kernel. But uh, we certainly won't be having this unlimited or effectively unlimited supply for kernels that are five, six, seven years old. So um, one immediate application of ML machine learning would be to automatically identify patches that are worth backporting, that are necessary to be backported by automated classification techniques. So, um, yeah, that's, that's not important. I said I wanted, I wanted to not give a too long talk. So let me skip that slide and come right to the core of what I, uh, initially intended to do so, there's um, software engineering papers and machine learning based software engineering papers are published at about the same speed um, as patches to the Linux kernel appears. So it's uh, quite impossible for someone to read them all and to make a fair selection. I think I have a, a fairly good overview of what is happening in the software engineering community for uh, based on my my own contributions to conferences to journals and to research uh, but i wanted to be as fair as possible and as objective as possible in uh, presenting uh, presenting approaches that may be of interest to the uh, linux ecosystem communities so i was trying to avoid um, making a strictly personal selection the method i chose then is to think of some appropriate keywords it's actually it's grown to quite a long list um, of keywords that i found um, to be relevant to include uh, to include research that is uh, that that should be that should be considered in the open source world and then did a web of science search um, for these keywords and then again had to select a subset because it was too many papers to discuss here. So in the end of the day, I ended up with a process that is still unfair and subjective, but I hope a little less unfair and a little less subjective than just um, just using my uh, my personal subjective judgment. Actually, I was I was half expecting there's someone from the uh, Linux Foundation here to check for code of conduct violations, and I was half expecting that my session will be immediately cancelled after I admit in public that I used a very unfair method. But obviously, I'm still good with that. Yeah. So what I ended up with is about fifty fifty top uh, top rated um, representative papers. Um, 
I guess I don't need to apologize for covering all covering them all in detail. Of course, I can provide you interesting references after the session um, if you tell me what um, uh, what what topics you are interested in. I and I can that's an active offer from me. I can give you guidance on. Um, what results to look into and probably whom to approach. So I'm not going, not going to cover any, um, any specific papers. I also didn't want to, want to highlight some, some research groups and others not, but I'm just going to give you the impression that I had from these papers, um, for which tasks machine learning methods could work well for your open source project or for your project that integrates and extends open source, um, open source software. So the categories I came up with that are potentially suited to machine learning techniques are fivefold. It's quality, reliability, communities, cooperation and processes, so more social topic, uh, testing and analyzing code at large scale, understanding licenses and code sharing, and finally, effort estimation. Um, I will focus on three of these. Oops, in particular, so it turns out it's not so easy to ad advance slides in a multi-screen scenario with this software. Okay, but I finally did it. Quality reliability. What can we say, um, what can we say about this? What people are doing here again, I'm not, I'm not, uh, mentioning any specific papers that would be boring, but if you're interested in any aspects of this uh, quality and reliability work that I'm mentioning now, please address me after the session and I can give you exhaustive lists of references and can also come up with references that are particularly suited for your specific problem. Um, the base, base thing that people are considering in this domain is uh, ex post analysis. So application diagnostics, bug reporting, um, and al analysis of system crashes and so on. The Linux community is um, using that partly uh, for Linux kernel development. For instance, there is um, there are some repositories that collect kernel crashes from the internet uh, that connect collect the um, coding messages and then try to classify these into um, into categories, assign the bugs to people who might be responsible for handling that and so on. Um, the techniques that people have shown, however, um, um, can be very, can be quite useful for improving your own applica or applications that you have uh, combined from open source components or the components as such by analyze by by finding the most critical portions of your software so it's not you can you can of course do that by simply counting which bugs appeared in uh, appeared in which source code module appeared in which file and so on but it turns out that this is not a very uh, that this is not a very accurate classification. So many more factors come into play. Uh, and with, uh, by, by uh, properly considering these factors, like um, the, the frequency of how people interact in files or by considering um, higher level dependencies between components that go beyond being placed in the, in the same file, or being placed in the same module, it's it's uh, possible to quite accurately predict um, things like where are bugs most likely to appear after changes have been done to certain portions of the code. Where should I um, direct more testing efforts and which testing efforts on my code and so on that can help to improve general quality and reliability of the software. Um, quality and reliability is also a big topic in safety analysis and people are actively trying um, for the reasons that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk to come up with safety arguments from measuring properties of um, software development processes like for instance measuring the amount of uh, the count of bugs or the, or the count of bug fixing commits that are brought into a repository. You can then see how these factors change over time, um, how the number of bug fixes goes down. The interesting question is, and 
there's a number of there's a number of research approaches to this is of course not a good idea to just count how many bugs do I have in a given time frame for a given kernel release because of course that will go down because people lose interest over time so it's essential to distinguish um to see what confounding factors are there that influence these um, direct measurements that we can make number of bugs but um what fraction of a decreasing number of bugs can be attributed to a decreasing interest in a given piece of software because a later release is out and what um uh, and how far does a decreasing number of bugs really indicate a growing software quality it's not a question that can be answered straightforwardly but a lot of effort has gone into um into finding these confounding factors by building proper statistical modeling and by doing proper learning on these models um and two more things i'd like to mention in the direction quality for under the umbrella of quality and reliability is analysis and um, simulation of user behavior i've mentioned that before so most projects um still use very very straightforward approaches um, to do testing under real conditions, under conditions that could stem from, from real user interactions. Um, there is, a, there are a number of quite sophisticated methods available that could very well improve the situation, but, uh, there is currently a big gap between the refinedness of the methods that are, would be available in research and the methods that are actually applied, um, in real projects that, uh, could use some um, some bridging the gap between them, and so there's there'd be lots of opportunities to try to try out many techniques um, regarding simulating proper user behavior. Um, performance is is another thing that is uh, fairly obvious in terms of quality and reliability, and should, in my opinion, also be considered more in open source projects, especially with the highly complicated and highly complex clouds deployments that we are facing where a large number of software components interacts with uh, each other in a very very hard to predict and in a very hard to understand way um, it's it's getting um, very hard to do proper performance tuning based on the traditional engineering approach so i know i have these and these knobs that i can turn i know what action which knob has and then i find by uh, including a priori knowledge or by appropriately setting setting values to um, setting parameters to values that are known to work in this and that scenario to get optimal performance from a system. Nowadays, we have so many tunable parameters, even for a, a simple stack that consists of a kernel, a database system, and a web application, that it's hardly possible to optimize uh, to optimize performance by hand, but uh, a, a very large number of very sophisticated um, exploration techniques for these large search spaces using AI and ML are available that could be used and um, should be used in um, anything but the least straightforward, but the most straightforward deployments. So the uh, second big topic that I mentioned is community, cooperation, and processes. Of course, uh, open source is much about communities, is much about um, how people interact on international scales in virtual, in real environments, how they cooperate. And uh, one would usually think that these are factors that are very hard to quantify and that are very hard to come by to understand with um, mathematical modeling and related techniques but again it turns out that this has been a topic that is very dear to the research communities and um, a large 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 number of software systems has been developed that can actually record interactions between people um, that can uh, infer how people communicate with each other, be that directly via mailing lists, be that um, via chat systems, be that indirectly via, be that indirectly via, say, commits to revision control systems where people work on similar or related parts of systems. And it turns out that a number of quite um, of quite interesting conclusions can be drawn from such data. For instance, people have shown that if you want to predict bugs, it's 
much less efficient to look at the traditional quality metrics of software, like um, how many cyclomatic complexity, how many loops did I um, did I use in a given portion how, portion of code, how many global variables do I have? All these um, traditional quality indicators. These are much worse quality indicators. So I wouldn't even call them quality indicators because most of them are just linearly related to source code size. So they're just basically random random measurements observables that you can easily get from a system. But these are not very, very apt for predicting things that actually interest you quality wise. It's much, much better or it's much easier to predict build system failures. Um, Defective components, areas in the source code where bugs will appear with high probability by looking at the communication structure between developers than by looking at these, um, at these more traditional factors. Of course, it's, um, um, not the easiest thing to do. And the problem is, although these, these, um, these techniques have very high potential, it's still quite a bit of a challenge to apply these to realistic systems where, uh, yeah, you stumble across all these nitty gritty technical details that you all know. So um, the typical experience when you try one of the tools that research provides in this area is you install the tool, it will not run. Uh, you get the, you beat the tool to run, you apply it to your software, it will crash for some reason or another, and then uh, you lose interest in that tool. That's kind of a drawback, but um, once you have once you have mastered this initial stage, and especially once uh, when you have not a an infinite number of choices between tools to make, because that does not necessarily make the problem of having to spend um, considerable uh, considerable upfront time investment to get these tools running. Uh, if you don't have this, if you can focus on a solution that um, promises to be useful, and again, I'm uh, making the offer that I can. Give you guidance on that in um, after the talk. Uh, then it's something that is really worth trying out with sometimes really um, astonishing and accurate predictions that can be made. Of course, someone sometimes the predictions are complete nonsense, but uh, well, that's the risk of life. Two more things, uh, or especially one more thing I'd like to mention in the, uh, in regards to communities, cooperation and processes is, uh, the notion of, or the um, adherence to processes in open source software at all. So while 15 years ago or 20 years ago, open source software may have been the wild west in terms of processes and people just did as they, uh, thought it was best, most, uh, large uh, processes these days have or think they have quite elaborate processes that should be followed. For instance, the Linux kernel community thinks a lot about how their development processes works and have, uh, should, are organized and have, has spent lots of effort on streamlining these processes and, um, trying to arrive at, at optimal processes. When you use these quantitative analysis methods, you have the possibility to actually extract the effective processes that people use from what you've measured. And it's, it's quite astonishing to compare these effective processes with what people think they're using as a process. And uh, knowing the difference can, of course, bring, bring many insights. Uh, firstly, you can think about why are we actually acting differently than we document in writing, but you can also think about are there perhaps reasons why uh, these process violations occur? And if you think about things like, say, security patches in the Linux kernel, the usual Linux kernel submission process would be your, um, a person writes a patch, sends it to a mailing list for discussion, um, then gets criticism, then improves the patch, sends it back to the mailing list. Uh, and at some point it, it's picked up by the respective maintenance and then um, travels upstream. If this doesn't happen, and if you see lots of patches that appear, uh, that appear in the repositories, but that were not covered by these processes. Of course, one obvious reason is that uh, this can be security related patches that developers intentionally do not want to discuss uh, on mailing lists before uh, disclosing the vulnerabilities, or perhaps it can also be 
developers um, misusing the process by bringing in deliberately ill-crafted uh, patches that introduce actually security um, risks or bugs into a project that you, of course, want to detect. Moving on to effort estimation, the uh, third a uh, big topic that I'd like to discuss with you. And here we have a, a bit of a mixed picture when it comes to research, at least in my subjective classification scheme. So what people obsess a lot about in this area is uh, how to measure patch acceptance times, how to, how to optimize patches for being quickly accepted into repositories. There is a a very large number of papers discussing discussing a very large um, amount of measures that or qualities that patches could have to be quickly accepted upstream but uh, in the end of the day i think that um, that most of these measures are either trivial because uh, so you can say that patches with trivial fixes go upstream quicker than, um, than patches that introduce large and complicated features, which is probably not to the greatest, does not contribute to the greatest astonishment in the community, but is something that can be very nicely mathematically modeled. Um, what's more interesting um, um, in that field is a ex post consideration how much effort it took to upstream a patch to develop a patch after it has been accepted into repositories because that can give you quite interesting insights on implementation costs now perhaps you would think that it doesn't matter how much it took to, uh, or that the information of how much uh, it, how much money how much effort it took to implement a, to implement a given change to a system is not very interesting after the fact it's been done but actually it turns out and everyone who has done who probably has done uh, software effort estimation knows that uh, estimating the efforts required to develop software upfront is about as hard as predicting airport opening times in Germany. If, you, if you're not from Germany and Europe, you may want to Google for Berlin airport to see why I'm so uh, why I'm obsessing for airport opening times. Uh, in this talk, it's one of our German engineering, engineering anti features that, uh, we can always use as, uh, example of how hard it is to predict things. But coming back to the, uh, to my, uh, discussion of effort estimation, it turns out that when you know X, when you have a large number of patches that you can, um, infer the, the costs it took to write them ex post. And this is very well possible with open source software. And especially it's very well possible on a per project basis because many projects these days have a very, very large history going back years, perhaps even decades. Then it's also possible to come up with models with specific, with specific models for a specific development situation that are close to uh, a given situation in, in open source projects that can help you very accurate, that can help you to predict very accurately in my, um, experience much more accurately than with all the uh, traditional guess and magic methods out there, how much effort will be required for your internal software projects, be that contributing to open source, be that integrating open source, or be that even uh, developing um, proprietary in-house software. Okay. So um, I promised that I wouldn't be using up too much of your time and leave time for uh, Q&A afterwards. I'm, I see I'm about to break this promise. So let me okay, discuss this quickly. Of course, there's a lot of challenges to applying, um, to applying research results to, to open source or to custom projects. It turns out that usually data validity is one of the major issues. Of course, it seems obvious that open source soft, open source systems, open source development leaves a lot of publicly accessible traces uh, that can be fed right into machine learning, machine learning techniques, machine learning algorithms and software. In reality, this is absolutely not the case. So it's it's really unbelievable 
how many broken encodings, how many um, ignored standards for emails, how many Yeah, how many broken things in, in every aspect of data communication, uh, you find on the internet. But again, with some, with some experience of uh, having suffered through this process of cleaning, cleaning the data, making sure it's properly, ver uh, it's, um, it's, um, consistent in its versions and making sure it's, uh, mostly free of contradictions. Um, you can, you can overcome this step again. I'm, uh, I'm happy to offer some guidance on uh, specific problems here after the talk. Another major problem in uh, just testing and just trying the many promising results of research in open source communities is that both communities are quite disconnected. Um, at the moment, so I've given, if you have the ability of going back in time, you can uh, go back uh, 23 hours from now and see my talk on um, in interactions between open source communities and scientific researchers, where I um, have taken the liberties of ranting a bit about this disconnect and how to how to resolve it. If not, uh, if you cannot travel back in time, perhaps the video recordings of this talk will be of interest for you. And um, two more things that uh, are challenging in the adoption of these uh, solutions is that um, research often uses commercial tools that are not available for the average open source developer because they're either proprietary and people don't want to use it deliberately or because they're simply in cost ranges that don't benefit just trying things out. And unfortunately, many, many interesting results are also focused on quite restricted settings regards to um, the used technologies like programming language. Uh, academia really favors Java and C Sharp a lot. And um, that's that's one obvious, obvious restriction that makes it hard to uh, to apply these approaches in open source systems. And don't even get me started on paywalls. I work in academia. I thought I would have, or I think I have really good access to all these um, services behind paywalls, but even I can often not access papers that promise substantial reductions in engineering efforts, that promise substantial improvement in software quality. I, I really don't know why people think it makes sense to hide such papers behind paywalls, because if uh, no one can read about the research, then that's the guarantee that it will never see any application in practice. Yeah, but that's a, that's a uh, long story. Good. Um, coming, coming to the end and leaving some time for discussion. Uh, the conclude, the conclusion, I, uh, one, one general, one general, caveat um, in applying scientific results or in um, manage in aligning expectations of what you can realistically expect from um, from a machine learning analysis and from of open source development processes um, is the same thing that can be said about recent events for instance the uh, COVID-19 pandemic now that everyone has become a, a hobby virologist and a hobby epidemiologist uh, people gained lots of interest in statistics and one particularly interesting comments on why so many forecasts for the behavior of the COVID-19 pandemic were wrong came from one of the leading researchers in this field, Nassim Taleb, who wrote a comment on single point forecasts for fat tail variables. And this comment, uh, or at least the first three points of this uh, comment, I can directly reuse to make the conclusion or to set, to set expectations what you can expect from um, such, uh, such scientific methods applied to open source projects. Uh, so his findings are that forecasting single variables in fat tailed domains is in violation of both common sense and probability theory. What he, um, um, without discussing what uh, fat tails in statistics exactly means, um, I'm just saying basically it's, uh, that you, that, that you are observing parameters that are not, um, not very uniformly and not very evenly or Gaussianly distributed, but that exhibit uh, distributions that are 
very skewed that are very unsymmetric. Uh, that's the same in um, measuring pandemics and in measuring many properties of software and open source systems. And what you cannot do, what people would usually like is um, statements about, okay, I have, I have uh, the source code base and the next bug will appear in precisely this spot. Or um, if you if you consider measuring latencies in real-time systems, then people would like to have statements like, okay, I, a latency of 27 milliseconds will appear caused by this and that um, combination of input events and code in the systems, but in the system. But that is not what um, what any realistic statistical model, what any realistic machine learning approach could give you because um, quite like pandemics, um, most most data that we experience in software engineering is also extremely fat tails, fat tailed and has also uh, other properties that make this kind of point based forecasting impossible. And let me close finally with uh, point number three that summarizes uh, the expectations very well. Science is not about making single point predictions, but understanding properties, which can sometimes be tested by single points. So what machine learning methods can give you is a, a better understanding of what you are doing, how your processes um, do, how your, your interaction, how your communication in the community is doing not on the basis of individual artifacts, be that files, be that person, be that whatever, but it can give you a, a much better understanding of the over what's going on in your pro in your project, in your code overall. And that will almost certainly lead to thoughts about how to improve these processes that will almost certainly lead to uh, really good ideas, how to improve code, how to improve structures, um, in your projects, but of course, you need uh, the curiosity and the, say, the willingness to apply the according techniques, even if it takes you a little bit of effort. And um, and patience. Okay, and with that, let me come to the end. So I'm listing again the five uh, the five um, domains that I personally think are most well suited um, to looking into when it comes to applying machine learning and AI. And uh, the final tip I am that I want to give you is really do try. I said approach a local researcher, but if you find something in the literature that's interesting to you. If I suggest something that's interesting to you, please really don't hesitate to contact these people, to tell these people, hey, I'm um, from open source project XYZ, I'm from company so-and-so, and, -so, and I'm, I'm interested in your techniques. And this is something that researchers are really looking forward to. But um, as one hears on scientific conferences, what happens too rarely, what doesn't happen often enough, People are really keen to hear back from you as practitioners and usually are also willing to spend quite a lot of efforts um, on adapting within reason, of course, on adapting their approaches to your specific problems and helping you with your product, with your uh, with um, with gaining insights using their methods. Um, so it's uh, some effort or it's, it's some it's some. Um, Approaching researchers with uh, with your problems is some effort that is really well spent and usually pays off very well. With that, uh, let me thank you for your attention so far. And while I was, as usual, much slower than I anticipated to be and have used up much more of your patience than I wanted to, uh, we still have a lot of time to... Um, to hear from your comments, questions, and so on. I already see one. So let me maybe start with that one. And let me stop the screen share before. So the question is, can you tell us what are some of the most meaningful metrics when attempting to make a model for effort estimation? So with effort estimation, um, I assume you are referring to developer time.
Or since since I'm not hearing hearing anything to the contrary from the uh, person asking a question, I assume yes. Um, and that that question has actually two aspects. So for one, I I said in the talk that using all the classical predictors to estimate efforts usually doesn't work so well. However, um, when you want to do a, it, it turns out when you're trying to train models that um, that predict the efforts, the monetary efforts, the personal efforts, and so on to implement features. Of course, the main problem is that you do not have that you do not have a, a very formal description of what the features will look like. That you only have a rough understanding um, of what you're heading to. And actually, there's it, it turns out that when you run then you run machine learning models, or when you run machine learning approaches on this kind of problem, one very effective approach is to first identify similar problems in other projects by it it, it of course it's it's a, a non-trivial problems how to apply these uh these similar the similar problems in other projects but i can give some references on that after the talk and once you have done that astonishingly it turns out that just using um the you have you have two good predictors then for the effort and that uh, a bit contradicts what i said before one very good predictor is the number of lines of code so again some some very elementary measure that is often linearly correlated to the uh, to the effort it takes to write the code once given that you have uh, found an appropriate scenario and what works even better is the number of commits because that uh, excludes some problems uh, when, for instance, you merge in uh, you merge in code to solve a problem from from other projects. When you would, what happens quite often in development projects, especially web based ones, you include uh, you include you include external libraries into your code, which then of course um, make the number of lines of code unreliable and so on. But the best uh the best uh best predictor then you can you can use is the number of commits because that uh that eliminates all these say variation factors if you can find suitably similar areas within systems okay are there any more questions or comments from the audience perhaps of uh, approaches you heard of that work well perhaps what i'd be even more interested in perhaps someone is actively using uh, machine learning ai in their projects no. okay if not then i'll still be around if you want to ask me specific questions for specific problems if you want to uh get get references for specific references for a uh, given scenario then i will still be around in the slack channel today and of course also tomorrow i would love to hear back from you there and pending and with no more open questions let me let me thank you for your attention and yeah i hope to see you again in person next year after we've hopefully um, finally combated the COVID pandemic. So everyone stay safe and hopefully see you next year. Enjoy the conference. Goodbye.